Welcome to Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp, President of Sharp Research and Translation. My guest today is Professor Larry Foster from the Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii, um, Manoa. Our show today, a uh, contemporary look at Chinese law. Uh, Professor Foster specializes in Chinese law. He often um, goes to China, uh, has practice in China, and is a, we're very lucky to have him with us here today. Welcome to Think Tech Asia. Thank you, Bill. Happy to be here. Great. Wow, Chinese law. Um, where do we start? Um, yeah. Well, it said that since Xi Jinping uh, ascended to power, mm -hmm. that one of his goals was to, how should we say, ramp up the Chinese legal system, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. give it more power, to give it more influence, uh, some suggestion of more independence. Uh, make it a more credible institution. Is that true? And if so, how far has he progressed on the road of goals he's set for himself? Yeah, uh, as, as, as with everything in China, it's complicated. <laughs> uh, the, what were uh, you saying? There's no transparency. <laughs> there's no transparency. The, uh, uh, well, let me give a little, little bit of background. Sure. The, uh, uh, Chinese, the, the legal system of the People's Republic of China started in 1978. So it's, it's a brand spanking new legal system. In, in 2012, the government issued a report saying that uh, after a lot of hard work, we now have a complete legal system. And pretty much everybody uh, around the world and within China says, yeah, the legal system is complete. Uh, the report then had a comma and it said, however, Comma. The problem is in the enforcement of, of the laws, and that, that's something that, that countries all around the world struggle with. So, 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 where does Xi Jinping fit in all this? He he fits in on sort of a a, a long line of people uh, within the system uh, trying to reform the system, uh, and he's just sort of the latest iteration of people trying to uh, trying to work on the system. The question is, in a lot of people's mind. Uh, is he, uh, does he see the law, in sort of a socialist terms, a, as a tool with which to govern the country? Uh, there, there's some Chinese language stuff that goes behind that. Uh, or is, is law in and of itself something that we, that you, you know, do, do we abide by the law or do we use the law to govern the country? Uh, and that's, uh, uh, we don't know. It's, it's very early in his term. Oh, you just preempted my next question. Where do you fall on that one? <laughs> <laughs> so when you look at, I'll, I'll, I'll narrow to the, uh, the legal system side. Okay. Uh, and and the, there's a really interesting, there, there's an email discussion list uh, called the uh, China Law Email List. And about four or five years ago, there was a very intense conversation about uh, where do you fall along the line on this? And, and people had marvelous little rubrics and, and, and little boxes where, where they could put people in. And, uh, I'm a simple guy from Kailua, so I, I keep it simple. Uh, you're either a, a dragon slayer or, or a panda hugger. I think so, you better explain those terms, though. Yeah. If that's the case, they might not be familiar with that yeah. kind of parlance. Yeah. So if, if we were, uh, uh, if I could bring some slides here, uh, I put up a slide now of me actually hugging a panda in, in, in China, which is an amazingly rewarding experience. Uh, uh, You've the, actually done that? I've actually hugged a panda, yeah, yeah. You're a brave guy. I mean, I see these pandas are just chomping through, you know, stalks of bamboo like it's yeah. nothing, and you're yeah. there hugging pandas. Well, this was wow. a very, very small panda. Oh, and, okay. And it was, it was actually, it was reaching up to me, uh, so I bent down to, and I thought about picking it up. I figured, now I better not do that. I get in trouble. <laughs> anyway, so the panda huggers, you know, these are the these are the people that you know China can do do no wrong. The the China apologist, if mm. you will, um, and and there's there's a num fair number of those people around around the world. Uh, we can see and, some of those folks in Washington. Uh, you see them all over. Uh, <laughs> and then the uh, the dragon slayer again, it sort of speaks for itself. There, there was a cover on the. Economist some years ago, and I kept trying to track down that cover, but it was a uh, uh, knight in shining arbor trying to fight off a dragon, and, and the dragon had a big s uh, hammer and sickle on it, and, mm. and that was the dragon slayer. So this is someone who is is, is very uh, 
uh, negative or at the extreme, negative, pessimistic, they call themselves realistic, as do the panda huggers. <laughs> um, sure. But so, so different approaches. My, myself, I kind of fall in between. I, I guess I call myself a uh, realistic panda hugger. Uh, so, <laughs> in, in all fairness, we should say there are dragon slayers in Washington as well. <laughs> yes, no, no, abs ab absolutely. Um, the, uh, you know, so I, I see the, the amazing things that have happened to the Chinese legal system since 1978. What's the uh, biggest amazing thing that you've seen? Um, well, probably the biggest amazing thing is, is the, the um, building of a legal system from, from literally zero to uh, a complete legal system. That's I remember there was a day when judges were actually retired PLA officers. Yes. So, um, so what happened, uh, well, uh, very quick history. Sure. Uh, China was an uh, uh, imperial empire for thousands of years. And then 1911, uh, a kid from Hawaii, Sun, uh, Sun Yat-sen, uh, started a revolution overthrew the Chinese government, the imperial government. Uh, and that was the founding of the Republic of China. Uh, so they, uh, they started to build a legal system, but little things like civil war and uh, Japanese uh, military action in China sort of uh, sort of lost focus on, on, on stuff. Uh, uh, 1949, then the uh, founding of the, of the People's Republic of China. Uh, so they start building a legal system for the People's Republic of China. Uh, that lasts for about eight or nine years until this uh, big anti-rightist campaign starts, the, mm -hmm. the Cultural Revolution right. starts. All of the judges uh, are uh, persecuted. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, many of them met very, very bad fates. Uh, you know, they were capitalist rotors and all of this stuff. Uh, this, the law this schools is, were shut down. This was the day when, it, how did they put that? Oh, law is the tool of the capitalist class. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very Marxist terminology. Uh, law schools were shut down. The Ministry of Justice was closed because we don't need a Ministry of Justice. Uh, so. 19, flash forward to 1978, uh, a fellow named Deng Xiaoping uh, comes to power, and he has a new idea for China, and that's sort of economic reform, this uh, socialist uh, market economy. And he reckons back then in 1978, 79, uh, he needs lawyers. In fact, he, he estimated he need 100 to 200,000 lawyers to sort of build this new, rebuild China. Uh, uh, because in order to have this economic system, you need laws and, 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 and all of this stuff. Uh, and then so the courts started operating again, and they looked around and said, well, where's the judges? Uh, well, sorry about that, but they're, they're long gone. So they needed <laughs> people to be judges. So they made what some would call a practical decision. Uh, they, they, they looked for people that uh, were very comfortable making decisions. That's what judges do. They, they decide. They hear people argue their sides and then they make their decision. Well, they had a lot of decision makers around, uh, army officers, retired army officers. So the, the first wave of, uh, major wave of judges in, in, in China after 1978 were retired military officers. Uh, 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 few, if any, were law trained. Uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in 1978, it didn't matter because there weren't any laws. But as the legal system builds up, then a realization is, we, gee, we really need to have qualified people come in as judges. So there have been changes slowly taking place in that area. Yeah, you said something really interesting there. There were, there were no laws to be had at any rate. Yeah. And, and, and it seems that due to that, as I see it anyway, law for a long time was, what does the police chief say is the law in a particular jurisdiction? That's the law. Um, yeah, so... Uh, there, there's uh, uh, a lot of discretion behind enforcing the law. So earlier when I said there were no laws, uh, I, was, uh, I misspoke. There, there were two laws. There was a criminal law and there was a marriage law. Okay. Uh, so uh, the police chief had a criminal law. And, okay. Uh, China is a, uh, like, like many places around the world, it's a unified national system. So it was mm -hmm. a national criminal law right. system. Uh, and as we see in any criminal law in any, in any jurisdiction around the world, uh, it's all about the enforcement, and you have great discretion. Mm. Uh, sometimes you, you know, go against this group of people, sometimes that group of people. It sort of depends on what the policy uh, 
is it in the government? You know, as far as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, okay, despite the legal reforms that have been made in China, and despite, mm -hmm. despite the, the increased power of the courts, mm -hmm. it's still that the police chief is still the premier legal official in a, say, like a major city or a particular jurisdiction. Yeah, I, uh, I don't have a clear sense of that. I, uh, uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me, but, you know, the, uh, uh, most everything in China is political. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the bigger complaint I hear, and, and it's still a large part of the equation, it's the, uh, it's the political committee within the judiciary that, uh, so the police chief can sort of pick and choose which cases they're going to bring forward, perhaps. Okay. But once it gets to, to, to court, then the, uh, there's, there's a committee within the judiciary at each court level mm. uh, that uh, uh, in the past had, had, had great power uh, to sort of make, make decisions uh, and assist the sitting judge to uh, reach, reach the right decision, if you will. Uh, that, is, that is slowly changing. And, and, and I guess it's a slight uh, digression, but uh, talking to foreign lawyers and Chinese lawyers in China, if, if you have a, and, and I'll stick on the civil side, sure. if, you, if you have a civil commercial case, let's take intellectual property sure. cases, uh, if you have an intellectual property case, uh, you're going to get pretty good justice in China uh, if you're in the big cities. This is for Chinese and foreigners alike. Yes, exactly, okay. exactly. You're gonna you're gonna get, uh, you know, you're you're gonna have judges who sort of you know, you know understand the area of law. That that's a big important uh, mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. So the judges are much better trained now, mm -hmm. uh, and and a lot, uh, some some specialized intellectual property courts and mm -hmm. things like that. But for commercial disputes in general and intellectual property disputes uh, uh, narrowly, again in the big cities, you get good justice. Uh, once you get outside of uh, the big cities, mm -hmm. maybe five cities, uh, which is a very, very small part of China, sure. uh, then things get more and more political mm -hmm. and uh, a little more complicated. Uh, um, you know, you, you were saying that, you know, Deng Xiaoping came along, uh, 1978, Deng Xiaoping comes along and says, well, we really have to move China along, so that means we're going to yeah. need some law, we're going to need some judges, we're going to need some lawyers. Yeah. Wasn't also part of his motivation the fact that um, he obviously had suffered during the Cultural Revolution along with others, and he saw some sort of restoration of a legal system as a way of winning people's support, bringing them to you know help get behind him and pushing these you know um, ideas about economic development. Yeah, I think that was a lot of what was behind his thinking, and. and uh, uh, behind the people's thinking as well. Um, the Cultural Revolution, most people in China uh, thought that, uh, in hindsight, well, as they were going through it as well, that was just a very bad time. That was and, a really and, and awful just, just terrible, period. brutal things took place uh, in that period of time. Uh, so uh, the thought is, wouldn't it be nice if we could avoid that again? So, so part of that, that's part of the motivation of uh, rebuilding a legal system. Uh, to have some some checks and balances in there. I remember he made a big thing about restoring the procuracy. Mm -hmm. And actually, it took me a while to understand exactly how the procuracy works. I mean, I, as far as I know, that's a that's a sort of an institutional concept inherited from the then Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And uh, correct me now if I if I got this wrong, but it's sort of the procuracy kind of combines the the powers of prosecutors along with a sort of, um, what should we call it, internal investigation arm to make sure that uh, everything is being done right, the cases are being carried out right, it has dual function, dual function as far as I know. Yeah, so I'm not a, I'm not a student of, the, uh, uh, of that organ of government, so, uh, but what you say makes, makes sense to me, yeah. I do, I, I don't know, for some reason, it took me a while to, to get my arms around that one. And I found that in courses I taught at HPU about, you know, the Chinese legal system, mm -hmm. that maybe it was because of me, I hope not. The students had a little trouble getting their arms around that, because it sounds kind of like an un-American kind of thing. Huh. It, it, I mean, the structure, yeah. as I said, it's, it's a Soviet idea. Yeah, it's, um, it's a complicated system. So, yeah. so the, the world's legal systems are divided 
ar not arbitrary, but they're sort of divided into common law, civil law, Roman law, Sharia law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, China is sort of betwixt and between. It, it's, we, uh, to uh, show off my Latin, it's sui generis. It's sort of a system unto itself. That's um, good. But uh, so in, in the criminal trials, for example, they, they pretty much follow the, the civil model that, mm -hmm. that you would see in France, Germany, Japan, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what have you. And in, uh, in that model, for example, uh, uh, the, uh, the role of the defense lawyer is very different. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the judge is the primary interrogator. Mm -hmm. The judge often is the primary investigator. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, people say, that, well, in the, uh, you know, in the Chinese system, you, know, you, don't, you, don't, get, you don't get to cross-examine people. Well, you don't get to cross-examine people in, in France or Germany or Japan either. This is the accusatorial model, right? The accusatorial model, okay. yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, I heard that China was moving more towards an um, uh, in inquisitorial model. Yeah, uh, so is that the, uh, I'm losing track of my models. That, that's sort of the inquisitory, accusatory. So the, the judge plays a very big role, in, in, and the lawyers pay much less of a role. In, in the sort of European system. In, in the European system, and, and, and in the Chinese system oh, as, as I, well. I heard somewhere along the line that, 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 that perhaps because of American influence, because there were so many stud students in, uh, from China mm -hmm. studying law in U.S. law school, mm -hmm. University of Hawaii law school, mm -hmm. that, that they wanted to move towards a more of an American model where, you know, um, judges could do, I mean, lawyers would have a more active role. Mm -hmm. I, I'm mm -hmm. not sure if that's gone anywhere. Yeah, so again, on the, on the, on the criminal side, I, I, I haven't looked, look closely at that, but okay. it, uh, you know, the, the judicial, the, the judges have been working on, on reforms. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, uh, we've, we've had a number of uh, heads of the Supreme Court and, and heads of the uh, bureaucracy uh, who have sort of taken that on as a, as a goal. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, uh, judicial education, there's some, some new rules out. Uh, uh, on a regular basis, there's new rules out that, that give better rights to defendants. Mm. Nowhere near the level that we see in the United States, right. but uh, much more than, than, than what it used to be. Uh, so, you know, you know uh, more opportunity to talk with your lawyer before you, uh, you know, talk to the prosecutors or the investigators and things like that. Uh, so some interesting changes and in being pushed by a lot of, and, and a lot of this is, you know, uh, these are people on the inside working for change. Mm -hmm. you know, this, is, this is not the President of the United States saying, China, you must change that system. Uh, we certainly see that. Right. Uh, uh, I just use the President as an example of an outside person or entity trying to influence China. But a lot of this comes from the inside. And, mm -hmm. and the Chinese, uh, uh, you look at the Chinese law professors and lawyers and, and, and even some of the judges, uh, you know, they're, uh, as with any group of people, they're a mixed bag of people. Uh, so some of them are, are very deep into substantial reform, some of them very much like the system they have. Great. Well, we're going to take a break now. Uh, you're watching Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our guest is uh, Dr. Larry Foster from the University of Hawaii Richardson School of Law. And we've been talking about the nature of contemporary Chinese law, and we'll be right back. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I host a show called Healthcare in Hawaii here on ThinkTech. We get together once a week or sometimes uh, twice a month, depends when we're busy, we get together less often, but we love to see you here to talk about the preeminent healthcare issues in our state. Our programs vary very widely. We talk about economics, we talk about healthcare, we talk about social issues on this program. Thanks for joining us. Aloha, Yappers. This is your host, Kingsley, from The Yap Show. Every Friday, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Time, you can catch us here live, Think Tech Hawaii, and then later on, we upload to our YouTube channel. We talk about youth issues, policies, uh, youth programs, and how to transition yourself into adulthood. Right. But this was like a sign, I guess. Hey, life's <laughs> like, hey, right. now's your chance to go back to school, which uh, I'm doing. Catch us here again live, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. Aloha. Welcome back to Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Dr. Larry Foster of the University of Hawaii Richardson School of Law. 
we've been having a really interesting conversation about the con nature of contemporary Chinese law. We've been talking about some of the reforms uh, that have taken place since 1978, and also more contemporaneously from the time that Xi Jinping ascended power. Um, we also talked a little bit about the traditional roots of Chinese law. So we're having a pretty, pretty, pretty interesting discussion here. Um, so really, that jury thing idea that China was talking about, that never really went anywhere. Um, to the best of my knowledge, no. I know, I know a fellow from Hawaii, uh, a retired judge from Maui, Shackley Rufetto, mm -hmm. uh, has, has been working on this in, in China. And uh, a number of, again, there's a number of people in China professors and lawyers who think this is kind of a cool idea. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, it hasn't really gotten any serious traction. But it's out there and it's being discussed. You know, I, I lived in Japan for some time, and um, I remember having this discussion at a drinking place, as we have all the discussions in Japan, right, with this Japanese judge. And he had just come back from America on one of these, learned about the American legal system tours that the State yeah. Department puts on. Yeah. He was left so aghast by the jury system. Oh my God, I could never function in a system like that. Because <laughs> I, I mean, my only guess is that, well, because why? That undercuts your power. That undercuts your influence. You're probably not into power sharing. But he was just so turned off by it. I, I wonder if the jury system goes against um, some sort of basic Asian ideas about authority. Um, I, that might be a little bit too broad. I think, you know, authority doesn't like to be interfered with mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in, in any Regardless in, of in any cultural culture. context. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but when, when, when the Japanese were looking at bringing back the jury system, uh, they uh, put a lot of effort into looking at that concept. And we had a lot of lawyers and judges and, and people from the Ministry of Justice in Japan coming to Hawaii mm -hmm. to uh, observe our, our jury system. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they were interested in, you know, one of the fears they have, you know, Japan has some cultural stratifications, if you will. So sure. if, if on the jury you would have a, uh, uh, the CEO of Mitsubishi and a housewife, uh, you know, how is the housewife going to, you know, going to react? Uh, and, and, and they also said, well, you know, Hawaii has a lot of Japanese, so how do, how do Japanese work in a jury system thing? Uh, I think what they found when they came to Hawaii is that pretty much all the judges in Hawaii and uh, uh, most, of the, most of the lawyers and the jury said, hey, this is a great system. This works. Mm. It's got huge flaws. Right. Uh, the O.J. Simpson trial maybe is, is one that it's used as an example of mm -hmm. a flaw. Uh, but, it, but it works. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have a modified version in Japan. What they do have in China, and again, I don't look at the criminal law that often, but they have something called people's assessors that sort of sit there with the judge. And uh, whether it's one or two, I can't recall. Um, but they add some extra, I guess in theory, perspective. But I don't really understand how that's That's on the criminal works. side? Only on the criminal side. OK. Right? Yeah. OK. Yeah. And, and so when, she, when Japan brought back the jury trial, they only brought it in, in major crimes. And uh, so, and, and the judges, uh, the judges don't like the system mm -hmm. uh, because it, it usurps some of their authority. I know. I I've heard too that South Korea has experimented with the jury system. I don't know. Yeah, I I I don't know much about it. I just heard that. I, I really don't know any facts. Yeah. It's interesting. It, it seems like Asian countries kind of want to look at the jury system, kind of want to know more about it, but maybe are not totally sold on it. Yeah. Well, I guess, the, I, I guess the bottom line issue is, so you have the decision maker, the judge. And uh, so the judge does, does, does two things, at least in the United States. Uh, it decides the law. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so in a jury system, you know, the judge always decides the law. Right. They, they don't ask the lay people what, what the law means. Uh, but they're, they're also the, uh, in, in many instances, they're the, uh, uh, what we call the trier of fact. They make a factual determination. Mm, mm. Who's telling the truth? Right. Uh, you know, occasionally in our newspapers here in Honolulu, we, we look, or on the TV, we, we see these trials taking place, and it's a he said, she said situation. Mm. And judges get very skilled at sort of figuring out, uh, you know, who's telling the truth. 
but sometimes it's good to have some other people sort of looking on um, and uh, assisting in that. Uh, but in this that is what would be the benefit of the assessors. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that that yeah. makes sense to me. Yeah, so it, so it kind of makes sense, but but whether or not it's 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 a requisite, uh, uh, I don't know. Because mm. you you talk to American judges and they they like the jury system, but they're very comfortable making factual decisions of themselves because they're very experienced at it. Mm. That's what they do all day long. You know, Your Honor, be lenient. I'll never do it again. I know I did it five times before, but I'll never do it again. And the judge, based on their experience, will, and, and looking at the case files and stuff, will make a decision, uh, you know, does he or she think they'll do it again or not? And, and they have that experience. A lay person doesn't. Now, as I understand it, um, you've spent a reasonable amount of time advising law schools in China. Uh, is that correct? Uh, well, actually, advising law schools in Japan. <laughs> in Japan? <laughs> of all places, when they were going through their legal education reform. Okay. Uh, in, in China, no. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I uh, 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 taught at a Chinese law school, uh, Peking University. Oh, has really? a has an uh, international law school. Okay. Uh, and I taught for them for three years. Uh -huh. uh, but they, they didn't require my advice. Well, okay. Peking University Law School, Beida. Um, mm -hmm. I think, just hearing Beidou, that the caliber of students there is going to be quite high. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Is that true uh, of Chinese law schools, regardless of where they are? Uh, generally speaking, do they attract the better, more gifted students? Well, that's an interesting question. So, <coughs> uh, you know, Deng Xiaoping said we need uh, 100 to 200,000 lawyers. And over the years since then, um, at various periods, uh, there's been a push to open more and more law schools. There are, and I don't have the precise number, but roughly 650 law schools mm -hmm. in China, or law programs in China okay. right now. Uh, uh, statistics tell me that each one of those students is not the most brilliant person sure. uh, around. Sure. Uh, uh, the, uh, and generally in, in Chinese education, there was a push to open up more and more universities, and right. part of it was, was the law side. Uh, you cannot, I think, increase uh, these kinds of institutions that quickly and maintain quality. Mm, mm. Uh, so that's so. Uh, having worked at a Chinese law firm and, and been in, in China talking to Chinese and, and uh, foreign lawyers there for eight years, uh, you know, you get uh, as, as, you know as as, as uh, dare I say Harvard Law School. There are some really good graduates coming out of Harvard and uh, some that maybe you don't want to hire. I don't mean to slam Harvard, but that's the truth of any any law school. That, that, that's true anywhere. Yeah, yeah. it's true. It, it's true anywhere. Uh, but when you have this 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 explosion of law programs, uh, the quality has to suffer. So, you see it generally in, in education. There's, there's a great concern about the quality of university graduates, and then more narrow to the professional schools like like a law faculty. Did you teach in Chinese or in English? I taught in English. Uh, this was an uh, interesting program that Beijing University started. Uh, uh, law in everywhere except the United States is taught at the undergraduate level. Mm -hmm. So uh, this was an experiment, and it's an ongoing experiment, to teach law at the graduate level, but it's an American law school. So they're teaching American law. It's a JD program in China. At, and this program is affiliated with Beida? It's, it's Beida's program. Uh, oh, so they bring in uh, uh, 90 students a year, mm -hmm. and uh, they get a three-year JD program. Wow. Uh, along the way, actually, for, for them, it winds up being a four-year program because these, these folks come from a variety of undergraduate programs in China, most of them not law-trained in Chinese no, law. That was the next question, were they? So the, uh, so the American professors, or the, uh, a bunch of European ones as well, uh, we, we teach in English, and we use our, our Socratic method, and legal analysis and stuff. Case study. Case study, call on the students to discuss cases. And mm. They go through the terror that law students go through in the U.S. every day. How, how were they, how were the Chinese students when it came to discussing the cases? Were they reticent? Or did you have to sort of keep plotting them along? They were, well, um, part of it's a language problem. Okay. So, so the language ability varied. Okay. But, but those that had good language ability, they did exceptionally well. I, I taught a uh, securities regulation class there and a woman in that class scored higher than any of my students in Hawaii ever scored in, in securities regulations. Just, just, right. just some brilliant people. That's really, really interesting. Yeah. But yeah, so so very uh, very open discussion. 
and then to get their, their masters in Chinese law, the professors would, would come from the law faculty at, 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 at Beijing University, Peking mm. University, and uh, teach them Chinese style, mm. which means that they would, uh, over the weekend, they'd spend six hours in class on Friday, on Saturday and Sunday, uh, getting nonstop lecture by the professor with no discussion, uh, mm. which, which is the way one teaches That's typically in an Asian undergraduate style. law. Yeah. It's Asian, European, uh, whatever. It, it's that, that undergraduate education Oh, the Europeans style. are like that, too. It's all, only the U.S. Do, uh, does not teach law at the undergraduate level. Uh, but I mean, the fact that, that, that the, the professor just kind of s s stands up there on a pedestal and lectures, and nobody is really encouraged to a ask questions. Uh, generally speaking, that's, 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 that's the rule. Yeah. Do the Europeans do it that way, too? That's my understanding. Okay. okay. Yeah. Latin America, South America, oh, interesting. Mexico. I didn't know that. Yeah. Hmm. I didn't yeah. know that at all. So American legal, legal education is, is different in, in, in many ways from mm. uh, uh, the, the substance in the... Uh, the uh, underlying pedagogy. Mm. Well, okay, you go through Chinese law school, um, and then to actually practice law, you have to pass a very difficult test. Yes. Extremely yeah. difficult. Yes, so they have a national bar exam, um, as they do in, in other Asian countries and mm -hmm. European countries like Japan. Uh, the pass rate, I think, is about 10%. Uh, for the Chinese bar, I think it's still the case that it's not required that you have gone to law school. Uh, Japan used to be that way, mm -hmm. they, but they changed it. So you get a lot of people sort of wandering into the bar exam. Mm -hmm. but, but it's a very low pass rate. Yeah. Uh, so, so in theory, the folks coming out of that, uh, or they're good test takers anyway. Uh, whether or not they're good lawyers is something that takes years of you know, experience in a law firm to uh, ferret out. Well, let's take another break here. Uh, this is Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Uh, our guest today is Dr. Larry Foster of the University of Hawaii Richardson School of Law. We've been talking about contemporary Chinese law. Uh, Professor Foster has uh, been relaying a lot of his experiences to us about teaching at a uh, well-known, highly respected Beijing University. And we'll be right back. Okay, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Ray Starling. We co-host a show called Hawaii, the state of clean energy, every Wednesday, 4 to 5 p.m. It's really interesting. You know, Ray has a way of unzipping these guys. He, he asks them these questions, and all this stuff tumbles out, and we find out stuff we would never know about without Ray's question. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome, uh, Jay. I, I'm very pleased to be your um, Ed McMahon <laughs> uh, every Wednesday at 4 o'clock here uh, on, uh, on the Internet. So you can join us and see what's happening in the energy world, and there is a lot going on. So join us uh, every Wednesday at 4 o'clock. Yeah, come around. Be energized right here on ThinkTech. Aloha. That's evolving in China. Yes. Uh, yeah. I keep hearing about lawsuits for all kinds of things in China. Uh, Certainly not frivolous lawsuits. Oh, never. <laughs> <laughs> a friend of mine, um, well, here's a China seminar. You might know him, Jin Lang. Well, he has, actually has a house in China, in Chinese way. Mm. Oh, okay. Well, welcome back to Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Uh, our guest today is Dr. Larry Foster of, of the University of Hawaii Richardson School of Law. We've been talking about the Chinese legal system. In this country, people are fairly conscious about the law. Uh, I think it's fair to say have a fairly high level of legal consciousness. Do you see that in China? Um, in contemporary China, absolutely yes. Uh, and I go back to uh, Deng Xiaoping. Mm -hmm. So it was in, in 1985 that a, a program was started to uh, popularize legal knowledge. Mm. Uh, by 1985, they had a couple more laws in the, in, on the books. Right, but. Uh, uh, again, back to your earlier comments about uh, uh, you know, uh, having a legal system to provide some protection to the, to the uh, citizens uh, and, and try to avoid the, the uh, perils of the Cultural Revolution. Mm. So uh, the, the spreading of, of uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in English we use the term legal consciousness, and, and they use the same literal translation in Chinese as well. Uh, so, so a lot of effort has, has taken place on, on that part from, from the government side. Uh, 
And uh, what you also see uh, in, in a related area, of, uh, I, I guess I'll call it social media. Uh, so if you're, if you're a Chinese employee in a Chinese or Western company and you just got fired, uh, what do you do? You go online. And there is just a, a ton of information online about your rights as a fired employee. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so you can get all kind. Of, well, as 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 with uh, the internet anywhere in the world, you know, some of it's better information than other. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But there there's just a lot of very good information out there, mm. uh, and that's part of this popularization of the uh, of, of 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 the law. And so what we've seen in China over the years is this uh, uh, concept that you know didn't exist for a long time in China: legal rights personal, individual legal rights mm. that uh, uh, you know, did not really exist uh, earlier on in China, uh, but now do. And uh, people are uh, extremely aware of these, of these rights. And uh, so we get, uh, and, and uh, there are lawyers and, and plaintiffs who uh, push these rights to the limit, uh, to the great dismay of the courts, uh, <laughs> the court system, uh, as, as we have in the United States as well. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a uh, uh, much better understanding of the law. And so if you go to a Chinese bookstore, uh, 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 there, there are just rows and rows and rows of how-to books. Uh, how to file a lawsuit. How to file a lawsuit, uh, employment law issues, how to draft a contract, uh, all these kinds of things. Uh, pop, uh, very simply written explanations of some of the more complex laws and things mm. like that. Things that we we don't really see that much in the United States. China's gone through a huge period of legal education, isn't it? Legal education or litig. Uh, um, I mean, uh, citizens are, you know, it sounds like spending a lot of time, effort, and energy on learning about the law mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. how it can help them. How it's yeah. not really a tool to be used against them. Yeah. Uh, well, so it can be, but yes. it can also they can yeah. also use it. So the problem with education is that now you know things. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, we were talking before the program started about China being a study in contradictions. Right, right, right. right. Uh, so to the great dismay of many government officials, the people now know they have rights. And they're, they're very eager to exercise those rights mm. uh, as against the government. And the government is not so eager to uh, entertain those kinds of uh, challenges. Um, labor law. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me labor law has made a lot of advances in recent years. Uh, very big, big the, the, the biggest advance was 2007. Okay. Um, a, a law came out called the Labor Contract Law. Okay. Uh, before that law, and, and, and what that did was that it, it memorialized and uh, increased the rights of workers. Uh, so I'll give you an example. A big construction project in, in, in Shanghai. Uh, most of the workers are from uh, out of town. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're there sort of in, in a gray economy area. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe there's 300 working on the job site. Before the labor contract law, the employer would report to the government, oh, I have 200 employees. So I'm going to pay my, my uh, you know, social insurance policies for them uh, on that. And if somebody gets into an industrial accident, the boss will say, oh, we've never seen that person before. They don't work here. The labor contract law stipulated that every single employee gets a written piece of paper, a labor contract, that says that they're an employee. Mm. And that piece of paper gets filed with the government. Mm. Uh, so that's one of the things. And again, so these individual rights are being, uh, are being protected. It, it seems to me that some of these um, advances in labor law mm -hmm. have been more stringently applied when it comes to a, a foreign firm than it does when it comes to a Chinese firm. Yeah. Is that a fair view? Uh, I, can't, I won't speak to that nearly to employment law, but uh, I know in, in a lot of other areas that issue comes up. So uh, two of the big issues right now in, in China are uh, enforcement of China's uh, uh, what we'll call antitrust law. Uh, in Asia, we often call anti-competition law. Okay. Uh, as well as uh, some new uh, anti-bribery, anti-corruption laws in mm. China. Uh, there's a sense in the Western, uh, uh, well, the international business community, so not just Western, but you know, 
Asia and, and wherever, uh, that these laws are not being uniformly applied uh, out there. Um, and uh, uh, it's hard to get empirical data on, on these kinds of things. Uh, but there is a sense they're being applied more against uh, uh, international companies as opposed to uh, local companies. We're coming down to about our last four minutes. Um, but I, I hope we still have enough time to, to somewhat get into this. Uh, if not, we'll just have to invite you back to speak another day. Yeah. How about um, intellectual property law? Mm -hmm. it, it, is that fairly applied? Yes, I, we talked a little bit about that earlier. So in the big cities, absolutely. OK, this it's, would be a case of it's, it's fairly applied. applied. It, OK, if it takes place in a big city. Yeah. yeah. So when, when we saw an intellectual property enforcement, um, well, my wife and I went out there in 2005. OK. And in 2005, people were saying, China will not enforce intellectual property until China has intellectual property. Mm. Uh, and since 2005, there's been a total sea change. And now 95% of the court cases are Chinese companies against Chinese companies uh, enforcing intellectual property. That, that's very interesting, because you, you can often get the impression that um, China is so eager to get foreign technology mm -hmm. and, and it makes a lot of deals like okay, we'll do a deal with you but you have to turn over your so much of your technology that I, I would think that the court system might be a little bit tilted in favor of the hometown boys rather yeah. than the foreigners. Well again in the big in the big cities now that's not the case oh, that's and, and, and you do have the, the more sophisticated judges okay. uh, and, and experienced in, 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 in this area. Okay. So regardless of, the, of what sort of law a case might fall into, overall you get a better shake in the cities than you do in the countryside. Uh, in, the big, in, 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 the big, uh, in, in the big major cities. Big major cities. You move away from Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, uh, Xiamen, and uh, things are different. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. It was great to have you here. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, uh, this is Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our guest today has been Dr. Larry Foster, and we'll see you next week.